Hello, art history students. Today we are going to talk about the Northern Baroque, but before we begin, I have a few slides just to refresh your memory on some key terms that are going to kind of crop back up and also sort of where we left Europe and uh, what the Baroque era means. Um, so let's get into that. There's a heavy, heavy use of symbolism during the Northern Renaissance, if you remember this artwork by Jan van Eyck. And then Baroque has this emphasis on the most dramatic part of the story. So if you remember these three Davids from the early High Italian Renaissance and then into Baroque Renaissance with Bernini's David, it is the most dramatic part of that story or the most dramatic moment. Baroque um, definitely has that heightened drama. And then there's this term that we brought out called tenebrism. That's that super extreme um, chiaroscuro. So there's like this dramatical or dramatic light source, right? Coming, it's almost like it's a staged light source coming from the bottom of the picture up. It's very dramatic, very, very dark, gloomy backgrounds, that sort of high intensity and low intensity light. And then experimental with organic architecture. So this is an Italian um, Baroque building. It comes a little bit later, but it's going to be very influential to some of the things that we're going to see in um, the later Northern Baroque and then also in uh, Rococo, which we're going to talk about next video. Okay, so again, the Renaissance aimed for this perfect symmetry that was uh, very iconic of their architecture. And then this building in the sort of Baroque um, era is very irregular shapes and this emphasis on um, decoration, curved walls and whatnot. Okay, now to Northern Baroque. So, there are some shifts in thinking during this time in history. Um, individualism is very uh, prominent and people are very interested in the enlightenment, what life means, those kinds of questions are being answered. And that is gonna shift who is being depicted in the art world. So the first artwork that we're gonna look at is Rembrandt, and this is the Night Watch. So there's a story behind this artwork. The story is these gentlemen are um, Dutch. They live in Holland and the Queen of Spain is supposed to come and visit their king. So there is a rumor or that there's like a plot to maybe kidnap her or to steal from her. There's some sort of menacing undertone going on where she may or may not be in danger. So she hires this group of men to watch out for her and sort of travel with her. And they are Dutch. And after it is over and she safely arrives and then goes about her life, these men are so proud of their own accomplishment of doing this, of, of watching her ship as it enters the harbor and sort of traveling with her, that they commissioned Rembrandt to paint this painting of themselves. So the people who paid for this are the regular individuals or all of the individuals that you see in the image. And they are regular people. They're not um, dukes and duchesses. They're essentially mercenaries. They're men for hire. Um, I'm not going to say that they're peasants of the lowest class. Their dress and their attire might look like they're a little bit more in the middle class, but they're regular people. So they're proud of their own accomplishments and they're memorializing that accomplishment eternally in this artwork. So this is something that we've seen all throughout history, think of the pyramids, of that sort of how great those pharaohs were. They were sort of memorializing their greatness through um, that artwork. These gentlemen are doing the same thing. The difference is, is that they're regular individuals. Okay, Johannes Vermeer is um, a Dutch painter of the Northern Baroque. 
and the Northern Baroque still has that same interest in light in the same way that the Italian Baroque uses light to create this sense of drama and the sense of action where the light is so much a part of the image. The, in the north, light takes on not so much of a menacing, kind of creepy undertone. So this is woman holding a balance. We can see this natural light streaming in on hitting her face. So there are a lot of bright light areas and then dark shadows. But what's captured here is this sort of everyday moment. This woman is kind of going about her daily activities and her daily routines, and the light is kind of just a part that's coming in to be part of that daily moment. We see more artworks like this all by Vermeer. This is the milkmaid, same sort of thing. There's that dramatic light source. The light is hitting one side of her face and then her other side is very much so in darkness. But it's that capturing of that daily moment, just that moment where she's pouring that milk um, after she's presumably milked the cows that sort of thing that's just a daily activity and a daily ritual and it's really elevating that and bringing that beauty of that everyday moment up to our attention this is Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring you have probably seen this artwork before it is very very famous right again that same dramatic use of light there is significantly more darkness in this image than there were in the others but it's just this simple portrait of this woman she's sort of looking back over her shoulder making direct eye contact with you as the viewer um, and then she has such a dark shadow cast sort of over her shoulder on her back so there's that very dramatic light source just the same as in the Italian Baroque but it's much less um, it is dramatic that make is one of the things that makes this artwork more dramatic, but it's not as menacing as a, um, it's sort of used in the South or in the Italian Baroque. Okay, so we saw this artwork way back in the very beginning of class and when we learned about contextual analysis. So all those different types of analysis, the social analysis of this being sort of the rural court and then the identity or the way we can identify um, the characters and the identity of the artist and how he's elevating his own social status. Hopefully you guys remember all that. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time um, recanting all that at this moment, but I wanted to put it in here so that way you fully understand this, like you can see this artwork now in its chronological context. Okay, so we're moving into French Baroque, and um, I'm going to use this artwork as an example to sort of put forward two big ideas in French Baroque that are going to keep coming back uh, as we look forward in at more artwork. So this is the Arcadian Shepherds. So just so you know, Arcadia or Arcadian area is a mountainous area of Greece. It's like an inlet area. It doesn't connect to the coast. And it in cultural society, this term Arcadian sometimes means this like romanticized version of living off the land. So these are the Arcadian shepherds, right? So they're these people, this idealized, kind of that, that term, kind of like the noble savage, if you're familiar with that, sort of this noble, idealized living with nature or next to nature. So let's look at this artwork in comparison to one that we've seen before. So this is Titian's pastoral concert that you, um, see and then the Arcadian shepherds. So there's quite a few similarities both visually and in the ideas that's being put forward. So in Titians, which came first, which is from the Venetian Renaissance, this woman is almost exactly copied by uh, the French Baroque artist. So we see that that direct link in these people, we also see that link in that sort of leisureful outdoor activity. So if you remember from the Venetian Renaissance, these people are enjoying this 
outdoor leisure lifestyle. There's like two women taking a bath outside as they sort of get music played to them um, in this very leisure activity. And then we see there's kind of like the super romanticized version of the same thing in the Arcadian Shepherds or a similar thing. They're supposed to be these characters who are living amongst their sheep, living off the land, which would truthfully be a very dirty job, a very un, um, unsophisticated job. And yet the characters that we see, they seem to be very happy. They seem to be well-dressed and very clean for people who are living outside. Um, so there's this very, very romanticized um, presentation, and it is coming from this previously romanticized notion of what was happening in the past. So we're going to see that coming forward as we talk more about specifically French Baroque, but in Northern Baroque in general, that leisure and then that romantic, romanticizing, um, romanticizing poverty, really. Okay, so during the later part of the Northern Baroque, so this would be the 1700s, European rulers at this time, there was this cultural understanding that these rulers derived their power from God. And that is where they had this divine right to rule. Um, there was extreme uh, wealth, there was an extreme wealth gap. Um, and there's really one ruler in particular that completely embodies this divine power and this like wealthy extravagance in the artwork that's created in his name. And so this is the Sun King, Louis XIV. This is Louis XIV. I love this painting. So let's break it down a little bit here. We're going to talk a little bit about wealth and we're also going to talk about power. So here Louis is. He's probably in his 60s at the time that this painting was created. He has this massive fur coat, right? So I know it might be kind of difficult to see, but you see all those little tiny black um, checkers or black specks within his fur coat. Those are the tips of the tail of the fur animal. So there's some kind of white mink or white creature and it has a little black tail and the only the tip of its tail is black. So that's how many of that little creature had to be um, used to make that very long, very big, extravagant fur coat that he's wearing. So I'm not particularly a fur as murder individual, but you can see the lavishness of that. It's it's folded over on itself. It's all draped behind him. It's completely going off the page. So that is a massive amount of wealth that he's showcasing there. So he also has his sword and his scepter that he's holding. And these are part of his sort of cultural power with the scepter and then his military power with the sword. Now, again, we said that he's in his 60s at this time, so he's not going to be using that sword, but it's there to showcase part of his power. Now, let's say, let's talk about the obvious. Look at those legs, right? This is a man in his 60s. He's standing there with his red shoes on. So, this is kind of a funny um, or a fun fun fact. High heels were invented by Louis XIV. He invented high heels specifically to make his legs look better. He was notoriously vain, um, but it wasn't really that it was specifically him and no one else. All of this ruling class, all of the folks who were related to him. He had been told since he was a child that he had this divine right to rule and that God was sort of had chosen him. So his vanity is sort of under, not understandable, but it, it was ingrained uh, in his upbringing. Now, Anytime any ladies go to put heels on from now on, you can curse Louis under your breath. Um, 
So let's look at his house that he built. Okay, there's some of that information. This is Versailles. So Chateau Versailles is the building that Louis built as his summer home. So originally it was a family owned, very large, humongous plot of land that was sort of the king's land to hunt on. And it had a cabin on it, right? So a hunting cabin, uh, probably much more elegant than any hunting cabin anyone in this area would use. But he decided to make this sort of his country home or his country area in which he would reside. So this is called the Baroque Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. All right, so let's look at where some of the inspiration for this may have come from. So this area is this super long hallway and it's basically used to greet people when they come in. This is just a hallway. This isn't even a room. This isn't even the master room of this building. It's just a hallway. Gives you a little bit of an idea of how extravagant this area is. So I just wanted to throw these two images in as a throwback, just so you guys can maybe remember and see where some of the inspiration for this Baroque Hall of Mirrors is coming from. So this one is from the early Italian Renaissance, and then this one is from the high Italian Renaissance. So some things I want to point out are all these frescoes that we see, the way in which these windows are sort of... Um, created and how beautiful they are and then remember how we talked about this use of real architecture and then faux architecture or sort of these fake architectural elements coming in especially on the Sistine Chapel ceiling now when we look at that Baroque Hall of Mirrors that Louis has created which this is it sort of during the daytime all lit up we see a lot of those same things. We see those same arches from the windows that we would have seen in the Sistine Chapel. We see that use of faux architecture, sort of everything is ornately um, arranged with sort of these architectural elements. This is the word grotesque comes to mind. Now, if you've used that word in language before, you probably think it just means like, ooh, gross. Um, what it actually means is just so much and overabundance. So this is an overabundance of decoration. Anywhere that there can be any little bit of decoration, it is pushed into there. It is so much decoration. And that is very iconic of Northern Baroque artwork, specifically architecture, but also their artwork. So um, I would love to see this, but I also, I can't, I, I can't lie, I have a love-hate relationship with this kind of artwork. So Versailles is a humongous area and a humongous space. As I said earlier, this was originally the king's hunting land or sort of his hunting cabin area. And, um, then when Louis built Versailles, so this is a uh, painting of Versailles as it expands into the distance. So this is a humongous plot of land. Now remember, the wealth gap is enormous at this time in history. So Andre Linode was the gardener, right? And when Louis sort of arrived at this area, it was basically rural land. So it was a hunting land. So it was used for um, only to go out there. Like I said, there was just a small hunting cabin. So he transformed that or Andre Linode transformed that by creating these manicured geometric shapes into the landscape. You see those? So this is sort of an aerial view of the layout and then also just a close up of some of these manicured shapes. Look at all, this is a current photograph, this one down here of all these little manicured trees cut into silly little shapes and whatnot. But this is how, think of how much time and effort would have gone in to just manicuring this landscape. And remember, this is not a place that other people go. This is for the king and his inner circle only. 
So it's a massive showcase of wealth that really no one else gets to see. It's it's I mean a lot of people would get to see it, but it's just it's just for him. All of this that you see up here in this layout image is all just for the king and his small little select group of people that would have lived there at Versailles with him. Small is probably a large number. All right, so these are the fountains at Versailles, and I want you just to note the influence from antiquity, that influence from Greece, especially that we took note of way, way back um, when we first started talking about that Arcadian Shepherd's artwork. Um, all of that influence is still coming forward in the Baroque era. There's very much that influence from Greece and the artwork of Greece. Um, but again, it's just for this royal display. It's not for any religious significance. It's just for the beauty that the king gets to experience.